All right, welcome back for Leviticus chapter 25. Now, this chapter is really an interesting chapter. Uh, this chapter talks about some uh, special Sabbaths that the children of Israel were asked to observe, uh, but these are very rarely ever talked about. We don't hear about these very much when we hear about discussions on the law of Moses and what the people did. You know, a lot of times we think of the children of Israel as pretty spiritually small. You know, I mean, they, they had the, the greater gospel was starting to be given to them and then they wouldn't live it. So they had to go with a lesser gospel and, you know, they had all these challenges and they didn't have enough faith to get into the promised land. So they had to go on a 40 day wanderer, you know, 40, 40 days, excuse me, 40 years of wandering. Um, <clears throat> uh, but we don't remember this chapter. This chapter has some laws in it that would be so fascinating to see what, you know, think about when we go through this chapter, what would it be like if these laws were lived today? Because these laws really, really pushed their faith. It really pushed them to have to understand how to rely on the Lord and work with him more. So not just these, these sacrifices that they give on an annual basis, they had to really sacrifice on, on these special Sabbaths. So let's learn about these and just ask yourself, what would it life be like if, if you had to live this? If society that you live in lived these laws? And then I'd love to hear in the comments what you think by the, at the end of this to see what would happen to society if these laws were lived in our day and age. It'd be so crazy, so amazing. Okay, so chapter 25, each seventh year is to be kept as a Sabbath year. Each 50th year is to be one of Jubilee in which liberty is proclaimed throughout the land. Laws are revealed for the sale and redemption of lands, houses, and servants. The land is the Lord's, as are the servants. Usury is forbidden. That by itself would really change a lot of stuff here in uh, the modern day. <coughs> Excuse me. So trying to get over a sore throat. Uh, all right, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Meaning, basically in verse 3 here, Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. So that which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of the vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee and for thy servant, for thy maid and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle and for thy beasts that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. And thou shalt, okay, so let me just pause right there for a second. So, not just one day in seven do they have a day of rest, but one day, one year in seven years. They also have a year of rest. That's what this is. So the seventh year, starting from the year they enter the promised land, they labor for six years to basically grow crops, to you know take care of the fields, to have food and sustenance. Then on the seventh year, they're not allowed to grow the crops for a whole year. They just, no, no farming, no agriculture for a year. Obviously, you got to take care of the animals because they have some, they have needs and things. But the thing is, is you're not growing crops. If anything springs up on its own, great. You're not to go harvest it and keep it. It is to just be there for anybody who wants it, basically. So you're really living on your food storage for a year. You've got six years to build it up, and then you have, you live on your food storage for a year, and then whatever grows, you can happen to, you can't go harvest it for yourself, but you can go eat it. Um, but it's, it's free for anybody and you just let the ground rest. You don't even, you don't sow it. You're not again, plowing, you're not doing anything for a year. 
that's pretty amazing. What would happen in your life if every seven years you just didn't go to work? You just rested. You just lived on a food storage, or if you had money saved up, you could save, use that money to you know, buy goods or things like that. But then again, of course, most places would shut down because they wouldn't be working either. So that would be pretty wild to think about that everybody basically just took a year off. You know, you lived on your food storage, you did stuff like that. I mean, I'm sure there's still some people that would be working and doing things, but maybe you wouldn't be doing much at all. And you just kind of had a year. You could go travel, do, you know, do other handiwork stuff, you know, fix things around your house, do other little odd jobs that you haven't been able to get to and just take the year off. And the point of it isn't to just have a year off. The point of it is to honor the Sabbath and really take that year to rely on God's help. He's going to be there to help you that year. So you have to sustain yourself with him, basically, and ask him to help you for that year. So that's pretty wild. That would be interesting. You know, what kind of faith would you have if you did that every seven years to really rely on God to help you, basically? Uh, that's pretty amazing. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments on that. Now, on top of that, they had a special Sabbath year called the Jubilee year. And that's what we're about to learn about now. And it says, and thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, or 49 years, basically. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be the unto thee 49 years. <clears throat> then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. Now, if you remember... It was, what, four or five chapters ago they talked about that Day of Atonement. This is a special holiday where they do a special sacrifice to the, to the Lord. The high priest goes in, does a bunch of extra sacrifices in front of the Holy of Holies. Uh, you know, there's all these things that you do. This is the Day of Atonement, okay? The Day of Atonement, debts are forgiven. Everybody is, you know, you, you don't have slaves. You kind of let them go for a while. They are, this is a special day where the people realize that their sins are forgiven by God. He, they put all their sins of the whole group onto a, a, a lamb. Uh, actually, a couple of them, I think a ram and a, and a bullock and a cut, you know, for the different sacrifices that day. And then they sacrifice them so that their sins are washed clean. So once a year, all their sins are washed clean. It's the Day of Atonement. So they're clean. They're free. They have been made free by God. So in year 50, basically, or 40, you know, you've gone 49 years. Uh, and then year 50 is this Jubilee. So on that Day of Atonement, after everything is done, normally on the Day of Atonement, you sound a trumpet that, that announces the Jubilee. And uh, this begins a year-long celebration, basically. So the atonement has been made, and now there's this huge party, this big celebration that happens. <clears throat> and I wouldn't say a huge like party, like, yay, music and dancing and stuff, uh, but more of a holy year comes, to, comes out, basically. So verse 10, Ye shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land, Unto all the inhabitants thereof, it shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. So, here's what happens. The Day of Atonement occurs so that the sins of the, of the tribes are forgiven. Everything's taken care of. It's all squared away with God. You are pronounced clean. Then, you pronounce this liberty. So the trumpet sound pronouncing liberty throughout all the land for everybody. And what that means is it says in here, in verse 10, you return every man in unto his possession. So anything you have borrowed from somebody, it all goes back that day. It all goes back. If you have a servant, they get released. 
to go live with their family. It's all wiped out. Okay. Uh, verse 11, a jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes of it in thy vineyard, in thy vine undressed. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is that seventh year Sabbath. Okay. So you've got the whole year. You don't, you don't plow your fields. You're not watering your fields. You're not tending your crops. You're not sowing seeds. You're not doing any of that. Whatever spontaneously arises is what you get basically. Uh, and that's it. So uh, it's the same thing, but this is the special one. So all your servants are let go. All debts are forgiven. Everything is cleared out, basically. Uh, verse 14, if thou sell aught to unto thy neighbor or buyest aught of thy neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. So you should not do anything negative against them like in a, in a transaction you're not trying to like screw your neighbor over basically you're trying to be helpful for your neighbor verse 15 according to the number of years after the jubilee thou shalt buy of thy neighbor and according to the number of years of the fruits he shall sell unto thee uh, according to the multitude of years thou shalt increase the price thereof and according to the fewness of years <clears throat> thou shalt diminish the price of it according to the number of years of the fruits doth he sell unto thee so they're talking about setting the price appropriately and having price increases and things. So there's not gouging going on, basically. Uh, verse 17, ye shall not therefore oppress one another. Thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, um, there's no, no trying to make too much money off your neighbor. You're not trying to hose your neighbor over. Uh, you know, you're you're not trying to make things worse for your neighbor and enrich yourself at their expense. Uh, so profit margins are set. You're, you have to be careful with what you do. You're erring on the side of helping them rather than hurting them. Uh, all, you know, lots of things are being changed that you wouldn't normally do in the rest of the year. I mean, hopefully you would, but for the society, it's, it's different. They're making an extra effort to not harm other people or hurt other people. Verse 18, wherefore ye shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and, and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety. <coughs> and the land shall yield her fruit, and ye shall eat your fill and dwell therein in safety. And verse 20, if ye shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase. Then will I command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. Ye shall sow the eighth year, and eat ye of old fruit until the ninth year. Until her fruits come in, ye shall eat of the old store. So they're, they're saying basically, because it takes time for things to grow. So God's going to start blessing you the year before, so that you have plenty to take care of you during that year. And then you start sowing again, but you'll still have extra to consume before your new crops come in. He's going to take care of the harvest and the sowing for you, basically. <clears throat> How would that be? You just to have a year, you don't, you don't go to work. You don't earn money. So you're living on your storage, basically. Whatever food storage and savings you've got is what, you've, what you're living on for the year. That's pretty crazy. Um, let's see. The verse 23, the land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. For ye are strangers and sojourners with me. In all the land of your position, ye shall grant a redemption for the land. So there's, you, you're not selling land. You're not exchanging lands. You're just kind of there. You're staying put, not, not moving. Um, verse 25 is interesting. If thy brother be waxen poor and has sold away some of his possession, if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. If the man have none to redeem it and himself be able to redeem it, let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. So if you had sold stuff off, you can get it back with just compensation to that person, of course. 
So that's really interesting. So somebody like, oh, that was a bad choice. I sold my land. Now I'm poor. That didn't work out so well. I can ask for it back with some, you know, obviously they're going to be having an increase. They're not selling it back at the same price. Depending on how many years they've had it, you give a little bit of an increase on those per year. Basically, that compensates them for the time they've had it. So they make a little bit on it as well. Uh, but then you can get it back and help improve the the wealth of that person again. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Verse 28. If he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold... Uh, sorry, I just lost my place. That which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of Jubilee. In the Jubilee it shall go out, and he shall return unto his possession. So if he's bought it, if he's transferred it, but he can't pay it back, then it actually gets resulted back uh, after in the year of Jubilee. If a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may redeem it with a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year may he redeem it. If it be not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city shall be established forever. To him that bought it throughout his generations, it shall not go out in the Jubilee. So if you buy it, you've got some time where you can, the owner can buy it back uh, around a Jubilee year. Uh, if he doesn't, though, with after that year, then it's free and clear yours, basically. You don't, then it can't come ask for it back. So the Jubilee year, things around this Jubilee year affected transactions and how things worked out. It really gave people an opportunity to fix wrongs. If they went, oh, that was a bad choice. I need to fix that. You know, it, it helped them to correct problems and, and challenges, basically. Uh, let's see, verse 31. But the houses of the villages which have no wall round about them shall be counted as the fields of the country. They may be redeemed and they shall go out in the Jubilee. So if your house is in the country where there's land, you're not just selling the house, you're selling the land with the house. And so th those count different than if, if it's just a house inside the city, basically. Uh, notwithstanding the Levites of the, the cities of the Levites and the houses of the cities of their possession, may the Levites redeem at any time. And if a man purchase of the Levites in the house that was sold, and the city of his possession shall go out in the year of Jubilee, for the houses of the cities of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. So the Levites, there are certain cities where the Levites would live. Remember, they're the priests. So they, if you bought a house from them, they actually could ask it back at any time. There's not a certain standard that says, nope, you can't get it back anymore because those are that's there. So they can get it back in exchange, which probably meant you didn't buy a house from a Levite very often because it could go back. Uh, verse 34, but the field of the suburbs of their cities may not be sold for it is their perpetual possession. So the Levites are not allowed to sell their land that they're, they're living on. Uh, verse 35, if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him, yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. So, if he's poor, he's living with you, you're going to help help them out, basically. So, that's the Jubilee years, helping people out to get back on their feet, to get improvement. <clears throat> so, really, the Jubilee year starts again at the Day of Atonement, when all sins are cleansed. Now it's a matter of righting wrongs and a matter of helping to equalize the people to get them in a more stable footing <clears throat> and to have a way to say, debts are forgiven, you can start fresh and clean. You can move forward with your life. You can improve. So really fascinating that uh, how this works out. Verse 37, thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. Meaning you can't loan people money in this year and expect expect to make a bunch of money off of them, basically. You can't. You, that's not what this year is about. You're about giving and supporting them, not making money off of them. Verse 38, uh, I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant. 
but as an hired servant and as a sojourner, and he shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. Then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family, and unto the possession of his father shall he return. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shall fear thy God. Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, the children of strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession. And you shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever, but over your brethren, the children of Israel, ye shall not rule one over another with rigor. So they're talking about uh, in servitude. Sometimes people would find themselves to be poor, and so I need to get, I need to make money, so I'm going to go work for somebody else, and they're going to pay me to be a servant to them. And that's how I can earn money and then go buy some land and build up my own wealth uh, and take care of things myself. So that was a very common thing, okay? Not, they call it servitude. It was employment, basically. Uh, and they're saying there's rules around who, on the year of Jubilee, most of your people are let go. They go back to their family, especially if they are members of the children of Israel. They go back to their land, their, their families, where their inheritance is, and uh, they are let free. If they're strangers, okay, they can still be a servant with you and help out, basically. But in the year of Jubilee, again, most everybody's let go. Because, I mean, think about it. If you don't have fields that you're taking care of, what do you do? You don't need servants that much because there's not much to do. So uh, that's, that's what they're saying, basically, is that uh, people would be let go. I mean, again, think about this in a modern-day situation, basically. Everybody would just... Most businesses would quit. Granted, there's some that would still be around, probably. I mean, police and fire, you know, the utilities, uh, electricity companies, those kinds of things, city governments, those kinds of things would probably still work. But most businesses would basically not be around or be at a very skeleton crew, basically. So, uh, and maybe not at all. Maybe we would just drop everything and not have that and just be people and would be helping each other out. So the inequality in a community would start to go away. Debts would be wiped out. Uh, there would be, again, servitudes would be let go. Um, you'd still be helping each other. You'd be under obligation to help each other, but it, it allows you to make the people more equal, basically. So that so it would help improve the conditions of inequality. That'd be pretty interesting. Pretty interesting in our society to do something like this. <clears throat> um, all right, let's see. Verse forty-seven. And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, with the stock of the stranger's family, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. Then he shall reckon with him that bought him from the year that he was sold to him unto the year of Jubilee. And the price of his sale shall be according to the number of years, according to the time of an hired servant shall be with him. So if there be yet many years behind, according to them, uh, he shall give again the price of his redemption out of the money that he was bought for. If there remain but few years unto the year of Jubilee, then he shall count with him, and according unto his years shall he give him again the price of his redemption. And as a yearly hired servant shall he be with him, and the other shall not rule with rigor over him in thy sight. And if he not be redeemed in these years, then he shall go out in the year of Jubilee, both he and his children with him. For unto the children of Israel are servants, and they are my servants, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So, again, there's a chance for them to be let go. They can say, this is the year of Jubilee, I need, I'm going to buy my brother from you. So if my brother was poor, and he became a servant of another person who's not a member of the house of Israel, uh, a stranger, then 
you can go buy them back basically. So it's an opportunity to be let free. Everybody was redeemed. Debts were, debts were canceled basically or taken care of. So all these things that can build inequalities inside a society are all let go so that they can have more equality. They can be free. Okay. So this allows them to really understand and, and rely on God to help compensate for some of these things. Uh, so that they can have that opportunity to feel like, to really, I guess, focus on that redeeming quality of the Savior and what he does for them, basically. So uh, here's something that was interesting um, about this. Uh, C.D. Ginsburg, Institutes of Biblical Law, said, On those days of the great, on the close of the great day of atonement, when the Hebrews realized that they had peace of mind, that their Heavenly Father had annulled their sins, that they had become reunited to Him. Through His forgiving mercy, every Israelite was called upon to proclaim throughout the land by nine blasts of the cornet that He too had given the soil rest, that He had freed every encumbered family estate, and that they had given liberty to every slave who was now to rejoin His kindred. Inasmuch as God had forgiven His debts, He also is to forgive His debtors. So that's kind of a good summary of what this Jubilee year was like. So every 50 years, this Jubilee year would come up and it would basically help equalize back the people and bring them back. What would that be like in our day and age to just, oh, guess what? Your loans are forgiven. Or there's like a, this year, you don't make any payments on your loans, basically. Um, loans are forgiven would be crazy in our, our day and age just because we're not... Our economy is so different. We're based on a much different type of economy uh, that deals with credit. So if all credit went away, our economy would collapse basically right now. Uh, so maybe it's a year where no, no debts are paid. There's nothing. There's no interest accruing on anything. Uh, you, and you have a maybe you have a chance of basically paying the debt in full that year. So if you can pay, if you can pay in the year of Jubilee, there's no interest. All the interest is wiped out if you can pay the principal in that year. And there's, if not, then you just don't pay anything for the whole year and there's no interest accruing for the year. You know, you're living on your food storage and your savings and the and the kindness of others and you let whatever crops you have grow. Uh, you know, it, it'll probably be something because of our, our economy and systems, you know, grocery stores would probably still be open uh, but it would probably revert to more of like a farmer's market type uh, concept. So there's still food, there's still things, but it's pretty, uh, it's easier to get. And it's, you're not necessarily having to go to a job. You're, you're, uh, you know, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see on that one. Cause I think there's still, you still need some people to work just in how society is set up these days. Um, but you would have lots of lot easier time with shifts and changing jobs and moving around and, and equalizing things out and relying on God to help you much, much more than before. So that'd be really fascinating. I'd, I'd look forward to hearing your comments uh, about what you think this would be like if we did, if we tried something like this, this is quite the year, quite the extension. So realize that people actually had faith and these types of events really push them to increase their faith and to really focus again on the redemption that Christ brings to them and that God is going to help them out. Uh, so the law of Moses is really fascinating and really does help us to improve our, our realization of what God does for us and helps us out. So I hope you're really enjoying these videos and we'll see you in the next chapter.